Um, I'll start by saying welcome uh, to the KSC seminar series, our sixth, I believe, of the semester for 2000 spring 2021, also known as the KSC 199 Faculty Student Scholarship Seminar, if you're registered as a student in the class. Um, those of you that are registered in the class were promised last week by me that I would post on the Canvas site a, a course assignment for the reaction paper. I did not do that. I will do it soon. Um, and I'm sorry for not uh, having followed through on that. Um, uh, attendance is up. If you're a, a member of the class, you might want to check just to make sure that I've got it right uh, and let me know if, if there's uh, something different in your records. Students and uh, uh, an invited set of others are here as panelists, participant panelists, um, and uh, they have regular Zoom uh, presence, active and muted microphones that they have a choice of, and cameras, uh, and they can talk and ask questions after. Uh, everyone else uh, who followed the link in the poster or the QR code uh, is here as an attendee. Uh, they can see the presentation, but they can't speak. Um, if you're an attendee uh, and you want to ask a question, you can type it into the uh, Q&A uh, bar, where I or one of the other hosts will make sure that, that your question gets put to the presenter uh, and that he sees or hears them. Uh, we can also change your status to participant and give you a live mic if you ask us and we see the question and, and follow through uh, accurately. Um, tonight's presentation is an artist talk. I've really been looking forward to this by John Gittleson from the Department of Art and Design. It features one of our colleagues from the School of Arts, uh, Education and Humanities. Uh, to introduce him, I'm gonna hand the screen over to Dr. Greg Knopf, a professor of history here at Keene State uh, and assistant dean of that school at the college. I'll return at the end of the presentation to help with questions and to help close the, the evening out. Uh, but for now, I'll hand it over to Greg. Thanks, Mike. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our great colleague in AEH, John Gittleson, who I have known for years. Some of you may know him already, I'm assuming. Uh, he is a professor in the art department and a very popular professor of art uh, as well. His scholarly and artistic work are, is, are in the mediums of photography, of artist books, video, installation, and public art. John did his education. He did his BA just right up the road at uh, Marlboro College, a place that many of us are familiar with. And he did his MFA in photography at Columbia College, which is in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, his scholarly artistic record is, is quite, quite impressive. Uh, trust me, I won't read through all of it. We won't get to his talk. He has his work in permanent exhibitions at a number of prominent museums, including the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the MFA in Boston, which many of you have probably visited, the Whitney Museum, and the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. He has extensively had both solo and group exhibitions throughout the area regionally, throughout New England and cities like Boston and scholarly institutions such as Dartmouth College, Harvard University. He has exhibited his work widely across the United States, including in major cities such as New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and his work has been exhibited internationally extensively, particularly in Germany, a number of cities, most prominently Berlin, uh, London in the UK, Copenhagen, throughout a number of cities in Canada, and Cyprus, which is an interesting place to have an exhibition as well, but also <laughs> widely, widely exhibited. Um, he has published extensively a series of catalogs anthologies and scholarly essays. And his talk tonight is gonna to be on, I believe his most recent work. I saw, I saw a little sample of the PowerPoints. It was cars, which is always an exciting topic. Was that right? Yeah. Uh, and he's gonna be talking about his recent work and where he's gonna be heading in the future. So please join me in welcoming John Gittleson. Hey everyone. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, Keene State, you know where I teach and uh, I'm really grateful for you all taking time tonight to, uh, to join me. I'm gonna walk you through uh, a number of my projects and we're gonna look at a bunch of pictures and I'm just gonna talk, talk, talk and um, I'm gonna jump right in. And so let me share my, my uh, keynote with you. Give me a second here. All right. So hopefully, Greg, we can see this looking, looking all right. Okay. 
So I'm going to just walk you through a number of my projects. Um, dating back before my time at Keene State, I started here in 2010. And um, yeah, it's a hodgepodge of projects. And that's kind of how I work as an artist. I work on lots of uh, shorter projects as opposed to projects that tend to expand for a number of years. So I was going to start tonight with just uh, my first kind of major project outside of graduate school when I graduated from Columbia College in 2004. And it was called the Car Project. And I think of tonight's presentation as kind of like a lot of storytelling. It's kind of how my work is. And um, I'm going to start with this image, which is from 2006. This is my car uh, in Chicago, Illinois. You can hear the band outside my office. Sounds real nice. Um, so I lived across the street from this nightclub in Chicago. And I, you know, I'll say, I'll start off by saying my parents are both sociologists. I come from a long line of people interested in the strangeness and wonder of the world around us. And I was uh, fresh out of graduate school. I was in Chicago, living across the street from this place called the Funky Buddha Lounge. And one thing that happened to me while I was living there was I started getting nightclub flyers every night stuff, stuffed into the windshield wiper of my car. Uh, if anyone who has ever lived or will live one day near a nightclub, you get flyered constantly. And I, I thought this was like a really interesting phenomenon because I'd come out every morning and they'd have like four or five flyers shoved under my windshield wipers and decided to start collecting them. So this, is, this uh, represents about a month and a half's worth of nightclub flyers that uh, had been shoved under my windshield wiper or like on a sidewalk right next to my car. And started thinking about like, wh what do I do with this? I think it's something interesting here to make art about, but, but what is that something? So I bought a car cover from an auto shop and hand sewed all of these flyers to my car. And essentially what I did was I, I would drive around I'd fold it up and put it in my trunk and I'd park in front of every night, nightclub that was flying my car. And then I would park my car right in front, put the club flyers on top and leave it there. And it kind of became like a, a temporary sculpture, you know, out in the public sphere. And yeah, what I wanted to do for this project was kind of photograph my car, the opposite of what was being advertised in the advertising. So the, the advertising was showing like, you know, Saturday night, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a big party. So I would go on like Sunday mornings when there was nobody, seemingly nobody around. There were, people would come and check it out. But, uh, and just wanted to kind of give the opposite impression of what was being advertised. Um, because I just found it to be such a weird phenomenon, the amount of waste uh, and just like the interesting imagery on the flyer. So these photographs are all at about uh, 40 by 50 inches. So you can read the flyers in the photographs. They're quite big. You can come to my office anytime you want. If you're here on campus, I've got one on my wall right in front of me right now. And it's a series of eight photographs of eight nightclubs. And what I like about this, I'm not, I've never been like a big club goer, but you know, nightclubs, they come and they go real quickly. So for me also, this is kind of like, it's a timestamp. It's like a history of a moment in Chicago's nightlife um, that is now long gone because I'm getting old. Uh, and when I installed this image uh, or this body of work in, in the gallery, I built a sculpture, a wire sculpture that was the shape of my car. So I could kind of give the impression that um, the car was parked in the middle of the gallery, even though it's a fourth floor apartment. So I start here because it kind of is going to show you a lineage that goes throughout my work, which is that I tend to work in terms of like indexes, like creating bodies of work that are just examining the same thing over and over. You know, there's seemingly it's the same picture. It's just the background changes. And uh, for this next body of work I'm going to share with you, I'm going to show you a bunch of bodies of work. So as opposed to diving for a half hour into one body of work. That's not really how I, how I function as an artist. Uh, the next body of work I'm gonna share with you though, it's called Items of Clothing Secretly Hidden by My Girlfriend So I Wouldn't Wear Them Anymore. And, you know, I try to look at the world in terms of what's around me that's interesting, but I also, you know, I do my best to, to look at the world with a, a slight sense of humor as well, or, you know, whatever. 
So basically the story behind this project, I'll tell you before I show you an image. I had uh, I just started living with my, my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And I noticed that like some of my clothing was slowly disappearing. And I would be like, you know, where's that shirt? Where's that bull shirt or, you know, whatever. And one day I was looking for something in our room and in the back of her closet, I found this bag. And in that bag was all the clothing I'd been missing and like longing for. And it turned out she, you know, being a, a loving person, she couldn't bear to watch me wear this clothing, but she also was not cruel enough to throw it away. So uh, the images are the item of clothing and the explanation for why it was removed from my wardrobe. Uh, Carhartt, Carhartt pocket t-shirt, white paint on the front and back. So a lot of like stains mainly. Um, Eastern Mountain Sports roll neck sweater, 100% wool. This was just, according to my wife, roll neck sweaters after 1991 is a, is a fashion no-no. So uh, Gap short sleeve polo shirt, coffee stain on the front. Gap long sleeve denim shirt, coffee stain on front. So again, like the car, it becomes this kind of serial imagery. And these are also printed at, they're printed at life scale. So when you see them in person, it's as if you're standing in front of the actual article of clothing. Another roll neck sweater, so double whammy. Um, John Harvard's brew house long sleeve t-shirt hole in the front. This one had bleach stains all over the front of it. Um, some industrial strength insulation foam on the front of this t-shirt. And then these pair of socks, which I did steal back because they're the best socks. I love them. I still wear them all the time. And actually I have one of these pictures hanging in my dining room just to, it's a nice little, nice little jab I get to give my wife every night uh, at dinner. So, and this is kind of, this is what it looked like installed. This was at the, um, the first New York photo festival. This was a pavilion set up by the Museum of Contemporary Photography, which is an institution in Chicago. And so you can see kind of the scale, they're pretty big. And, you know, it's just the articles of clothing hanging on clothing wires. Um, you know, fr from here, I'm gonna jump to my website for this project because it's more of a web-based piece. <clears throat> but as, as I think you're starting to maybe see, my work, especially at this time, was really inspired by the world that was around me. You know, just like, you see something weird and you're like, I wanna make something about that. So the garbage can project was a piece that ran from 2005 to 2008. And essentially what we're looking at here, this is, uh, this is my apartment, the, the first floor window in Chicago. It's right across from that funky Buddha lounge nightclub shop. So this apartment was a lot of inspiration. My wife and I were the building managers. And what that meant basically was we just had to collect everyone's rent. You know, we got a little discount and had to do things like call the maintenance people if something happened. And these were our garbage cans. It's, it's not LOL, it's 707, 707 West Grand Avenue. And what happened was our garbage cans started being stolen like constantly, all the time. We would have like 12 garbage cans stolen in one year. And I'd have to call the city and say like, we need a replacement. And of course that piqued my interest and made me think, I wanna make an art project about these, <laughs> this garbage can theft that I have no idea what's going on here. So uh, the project, I decided to make an art project that was web-based, meaning that I built a website and every day I would upload a picture of my garbage cans on that day. So people could kind of track it live. It was like um, live footage. And sh about a year into it, I also set up uh, 24 hour surveillance cameras into those plants, those little cameras. And I would film people, anytime somebody touched my garbage can, I would edit that clip and upload it the next day. So it was this like kind of live tracking system of these garbage cans. And, um, and, and shortly after beginning it, it kind of became obvious to me that this was actually like less about the garbage cans and more about the strange things that happen if you just look out your window long enough. You know? So I'm gonna jump to my website real quick. And if this isn't graceful, you'll, you'll pardon me. Okay, so go to the web. Oh no, my tab's closed. It's okay. And I'm gonna share my screen with you real quick. So what happens with 
digital art, unfortunately, is over time technology advances and the website that was built can no longer run. It was built on a programming software that no longer functions. So I rebuilt it uh, here on my website where you can essentially go to any month throughout the project in any date. So if I go to two, April, 2007, I can see um, the garbage can from April 3rd in the video clip, April 4th in the video clip. And so it's become this three, three year archive of my garbage cans and what they were doing. So I'll give you some examples of this. Let me see here. This music behind me is really nice for this lecture. I don't know if you all can hear it, but. Um, okay, so part of the website was there's a timeline. And this timeline is kind of represents uh, anytime something happened to my garbage can. So it started on December 5th or December 10th, 2005 cart was stolen, a phone call to the city, and anything related to this, I would document. So if I called the city, I would record the phone call and upload it to the website. If I found something next to my garbage can, I would take pictures of it and upload it to the website. And so um, a few of the highlights, I'll show you a few highlights. Um, this is my favorite day of the entire thing. And so video to kind of illustrate the strange things that happen um, when you look out your window long enough. So this is March 12th, 2007. Day starts at 10.47 a.m. And this man puts his, gar his uh, coffee cup down on my garbage can. Fast forward a couple hours. Different person. It's a nice swig. This was the only day of the whole project where I caught someone stealing my garbage can. We had 12 stolen during the duration of the, the project. I was usually traveling a lot, so I'd be out of town and come back and a bunch would be missing. Um, but this one I, I was able to capture. And uh, the number 10 that's on the garbage can, I was trying to track them via Google Earth. Um, so that's what that was painted there for. And there it goes. Never did quite solve this mystery. I have my, my theories, but um, not quite sure. Um, I'll show you, share one more video from this that I think is pretty amazing, which is um, this very acrobatic rat. Chicago, you know, rats happens. This is just... Um, Another piece of footage, this is November 29th, 2006. And yeah, so again, like anytime someone would touch my garbage can, that clip would get edited. I would every morning fast forward through 24 hours of footage. And if I saw something happen, I would import it to my computer and, and splice it up. This guy takes something out of my garbage can. All right, here we go. Get ready. It's going to be sweet. Isn't that amazing? There goes the tail. Okay, so yeah, the wonder of the world when you when you stop and you take a closer look at it. Um, and like I said, this was you know this was a three year project that was just every day I would upload um, what had happened. And then a really cool thing happened a couple of years later. Actually, my first year at Keene State, I was invited to make create an installation of this project. It was at the um, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art out in Arizona, and it was fun to think about like how do you take something that was designed for the web and meant for the web and then turn it into something physical. And it was, it was a fun, playful thing to do. So I'll show you a few installation views. Um, so what I decided to do for this was 
Uh, framed on the wall, you have a letter from Mayor Daly, who was the mayor at the time, thanking me for reporting my, my stolen garbage cans. And then another kind of um, artifact of the project, a telephone that played, it just looped all of my phone calls to the city requesting more garbage cans, uh, a calendar with every photograph from the project. These are the notes. Um, and then a computer that would play the entire footage. It was 10 and a half hours of video footage of people interacting along with a guide plant uh, with a camera in it, reenacting my, my surveillance setup in the apartment and a garbage uh, suitcase that was left behind my garbage cans with really all kinds of interesting detritus from uh, graduation tassels to uh, half drank Jameson bottles of whiskey to um, dust, dust objects. I don't know, all kinds of weird stuff. So, um, so yeah, that, that was uh, happening. And while I was working on that, let me jump back to my PowerPoint. Um, I received a commission from the city of Chicago to create my first public artwork. Um, so this is about 2007, 2008. And basically the, I was hired by the city of Chicago and also the Chicago Transit Authority, um, which is like the subway system there. And was invited to write a proposal and it was accepted to create a, um, a public artwork. And this is still there, it's, it was, it was you know, hopefully it'll be there for the rest of my life. Um, and it's a 40 foot by 10 foot installation right when you walk inside of the Armitage Brown Line station in Chicago. And uh, so this is on the opposite side of the turnstiles. It's made of glass tiles. Uh, each of the images is 20 by 24 inches. And essentially, you know, when I think about public art, which is something that I really care about as an artist, I think about it as it connects to the people who have to interact with it, right? Like it's it's site specific and it's certain people who engage with it. So how do you make a work of art that reflects that? So at the time, the city of Chicago was tearing down the old Armitage Brown Line station for renovation and then putting up a new one. It's a very historic station. And so I decided what I wanted to do was spend the months leading up to the demolition interviewing people on the train platform and asking them to share with me a story from their life in Chicago that was meaningful or significant. Um, and just conducted as many interviews as I could. It took a lot of practice learning how to ask the right questions, you know, to get in answers that were more nuanced than blah, 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 bar or this park. And, um, and the end of my interview would always end with where would I stand if I wanted to make a photograph of exactly where the story took place? Because, because I was working with this for the city, there were a lot of stipulations. For example, I couldn't have any pictures of people in any of my photographs um, for liability reasons. And so I wanted to try to illustrate a story without the presence of a person. And I'm gonna jump to my website again because this is best shown there. Um, give me half a second. Okay. So let me show you what this looks like. Uh, each of these tiles is a photograph of the location and underneath is a, is a typed excerpt of the, um, of the story. And the grid in the background, that black and white pattern, that's a street map of that neighborhood, like right where the station is. So it's like the intersection where all these stories come together on this wall. Um, so when you walk through the turnstiles, it looks a bit like this. And just a couple of views, let me shrink it down a little bit. So you can kind of see that there's text beneath the tiles, the images, and a sense of scale. So for me, um, although that was the best solution I could come up with because, you know, all these weird public art things, like it had to be power, it has to be power washed every day. There can't be any electricity, but I really loved the recordings. And I liked hearing the stories 
of the people in their own voices. So um, on the website, I built a customized website, which I've since integrated into this one, where there's the complete pictures and then the stories as well. So if you'll indulge me, I'll share with you a story uh, from this project to give you a taste of what it sounds like. This is one of my favorites, and I hope you can hear it. A special place for me is Hyde Park. Uh, when I was a kid, I came up in Robert Taylor Homes and came from the west side of Chicago. And Chicago's always been bleak uh, based on where I've lived and based on the conditions I had to live under. We got to the south side. I moved in Robert Taylor Homes. And I'll never forget one day we went over to Hyde Park just exploring. And when I crossed, Drexel Avenue into Hyde Park at 51st Street. I literally thought I was in another town. I didn't know people lived the way they lived as they were living in Hyde Park. And this is about 1962. My experiences had been from the slums on the west side of Chicago to the projects on the south side. And so when I went over to Hyde Park, I literally thought I was in another city. Yeah, it helped to refocus me and let me know that there's something else out there. Exposure is what it's all about. And Hyde Park exposed me to a whole new world and uh, my life never been the same since. So the, on the website, which you're welcome to go to, um, there's 40 stories in the project and all 40 contain the actual um, audio interviews in completion with the, the uh, people who spoke with me. So the last project I made in Chicago before I moved here to, um, well, I live in Brattleboro, but you know, to the Keene State campus where, where I call home uh, in my office was called The Sweet Spot. And you're gonna see how neurotic I really can, can be um, through this project if you haven't already figured it out. Uh, the sp Sweet Spot was based on my morning commute. Uh, this is not a picture I took. I took this from, Wiki from Wikipedia, but this was my, my train station where I commuted every day from uh, my house to downtown, go to work. And for anyone who's ever lived in a city, uh, you might know this experience where every day the train would come into the station and I would try to calculate where I thought the doors would open. because so I thought if the door opened in front of me, I could get in the train and get a seat. Otherwise I had to stand for 45 minutes. And um, in New York, a lot of times people figure out like where the train's gonna to get off the train at the other side, so whatever. I decided I wanted to figure this out. I wanted to see where the sweet spot was in the station <clears throat> to figure out if the where the train door stops. And it being Chicago, of course, there was no rhyme or reason to it is the, is the long, short story long I'm gonna give you. Um, but I started out by doing this. Uh, if you can see it's wood planked platform. So I began by numbering the planks of wood, every fifth plank of wood, uh, just with a Sharpie marker from zero to like, whatever, 800 and something. And I started to measure, okay, there's X amount of planks of wood between door one and door two, door two and door three. So by figuring this out, I could figure out exactly if I walked in door two on the train, I knew what planks of wood every other door were as they pulled into the station. And I did this for 50 days. So I would go every morning and I would just take all of this data and I created a kind of template so this was, these are pages from a notepad that I was keeping. Um, and it was always the same at the top. What day it was, did I stand on the sweet spot, meaning where the door opened? Um, what train did I enter? What door did I get a seat? How many seats were free? The temperature, et cetera, et cetera. But at the bottom part, I would also take notes on other things that I noticed. For example, the ticket guy in the ticket window would always lay out his breakfast. It was always like a, a, a array of fruit. And so I started taking no notes on like, if he has a grapefruit, how does that increase the statistical odds of my getting a seat on the train? Uh, if he has raisins in an apple, is that different than if he just has an orange? And just kind of letting my imagination go wherever it's gonna go. Um, and so I ended up with 50 of these notes with all of the station data. And when it was all accumulated, I created this map. This is a nine foot by four foot hand-drawn map of my data. Essentially what we're looking at here, 
like I said, this is where it gets neurotic, is um, the platform on the bottom is like a bird's eye view. The, on the left-hand side, we have day one all the way up to day 50 as the train came in the station, all of the car doors, and then like this coded system for how to read the data. So this is a close-up of what it looks like. Um, it, it's uh, made with pencil and marker and whiteout and paint and all kinds of different materials. Um, if I stood on a sweet spot, there'd be an explosion. That means like that, that day I nailed it. If there's an explosion with an X, it means I stood at the sweet spot, I still didn't get a seat. Um, this is the trains leaving the station. And basically there's the train stop wherever they want to stop. There's like, there is no scientific method here at all. Um, this at the bottom of the grid, you can see this weird graph. And what the graph is, is I would take each plan, each board on the platform and go all the way up my data and count how many times a door stopped at that plank of wood over 50 days. And the graph at the bottom represents that. And then finally, these keys on the map so you can kind of understand like what the different coding means and then some statistics um the most mind-blowing is that when the doors opened in front of me i was 25 percent less likely to get a seat than if i had to walk to the doors so my whole theory was wrong um and i had a friend who was a statistician help me break down all of this data um and then also like information about how big the planks of wood are you know, in case anybody wants to become a specialist on my adventures at the Brown Line Station. Um, and then I took a photograph. It turned out there were seven sweet spots that were equally sweet. But like I said, it didn't matter because I still didn't get a seat if I stood there. Um, so there's seven photographs, one of me at each of the planks of wood that most frequently had a door stop at it. And then to give you an idea of what this, <laughs> this whole mess looks like installed, uh, this was also at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, recreated the platform to scale on the floor using tape, duct tape and vinyl lettering. Had uh, the nine foot map, the photographs, as well as a vitrine of all of the notes. So visitors to the museum could kind of experience this. And then I moved to Vermont, you know, and my world changed. Um, but my interest in strange, weird stuff did not. And so uh, the last note of Brattleboro was the first project I made after becoming a faculty member at Keene State College. It was 2010, 2011. And it turned out to be the most snow in the state of Vermont in 100 years that winter, in terms of like weather data. There were 161 inches. And that April, when this photograph was made, I was, it was like that first day, kind of like we've had recently where it's like sunny out and um, you feel like spring is happening. Like you, you trick yourself. And so I was walking to my studio and I was hearing the birds and I was feeling it like it was spring. And I looked down and I saw a pile of snow and it was so disheartening. And I was just like, oh my God, is this winter ever gonna end? So being slightly neurotic, I decided to drive all over town and map every pile of snow I could find and track them until they all melted, just to prove that like winter was done. So this is again, nine feet by about um, four and a half feet, hand-drawn. Every one of those circles is a photograph of a pile of snow that I identified as I drove around. This is just like a close-up to kind of give you an idea of what the map looks like when you look at it closely. Um, data, you know, I always love like pseudoscience. I'm not a scientist. I'm just like uh, someone who likes pseudoscience. <laughs> so like, but this is true. Like there were uh, 63 inches in January, 2011 in Brattleboro and there were 52 in February. It was insane. Um, and then once I collected this data I, and found the final snow pile, I made a handmade sign, which I planted in the pile and I left it there. So that, like everyone who walked past could maybe with confusion, but like look and say, that's the last snow in Brattleboro. It's almost over. And so this is the last day of the last snow in Brattleboro, according to me, because who knows, you know, there's probably a pile somewhere I didn't find. 
But uh, in any case, and this is what it looked like installed. Um, this is in Germany. So another thing that I really love doing and that I've actually taught here at Keene State is bookmaking. Um, my background when I was in college, my degree was in uh, literature and photography. And so I've always had a real passion for books and I love making them. So I'm gonna share with you two very short books that I made. Um, these are hand bound. They're not like published with like a publisher or anything. They're artist books. So the first is called My Four Beds. And this is the cover. And I'm just gonna read you the text in the beginning. It explains the whole thing. Um, so, oops, wait, I can't see because of Zoom, so. I'll just tell you every night between 10.30 and 12 a.m. Let me see if I can make this smaller. Uh, every night between 10.30 p.m. and 12 a.m., I go to sleep in the bed that I share with my wife. We're often jo joined by our cat, Wally, and on most nights by our 11-month-old daughter, Olive. Every night between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., my three-year-old son, Archie, comes into our room and taps me on the shoulder which is his way of telling me that it's time to get up and find a different place to sleep so he can take my place in the bed. There are two beds that I rotate between for this second phase of the night. Archie's bed in his bedroom or our guest futon, depending on whether or not it's already been opened for up into a bed. Every morning between six and 7 a.m., Archie taps my shoulder for a second time, which is his way of telling me that I can go back to I, that it's time to go downstairs to the couch so that I can go back to sleep and he can sit on top of me and watch an episode of Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, all right, cool. I'm not sure if you're able to still see this. So let me, if someone can just tell me, yes. Okay, we're good, can you see it? Okay. So basically the book is just my four beds, you know, my bed, one of the two beds that I get relocated to in the middle of the night. And this is years ago, they're now bigger kids. The other bed, that I sometimes got relocated to in the couch. And that's the book. So I like these short, simple books. Um, another one that I'll share with you really quickly is called Sunset. This is from a few years ago. And this just came from looking at my hand. Um, it's a small handmade book. And what I noticed is that the cuticles on my, on my nails, when I looked at them were like a setting sun. The biggest one was on my thumb, the smallest was on my pinky. And so as, as I would look at my fingers, I was like watching a sunset. And that's the book, it's very simple. Um, and then moving forward a little bit in uh, 2015, I got the opportunity that was for me really um, exciting and meaningful. Uh, to have an exhibition at Mass Mocha, which is like my favorite museum. And <laughs> this is a project called Marginalia. It was an installation. And if you don't know this phrase, what it means is the things that are written in books, right? What we write in the margins, the markings that we make. And I've always been really interested in like stories and like, the, I love the idea that um, when you write in a book and then sell it used, it's like you're marking information and wisdom and then releasing it back into the universe. And so I started going to used bookstores um, around the area and looking for any book that had the markings of a previous owner. So I like to think of it like I was a DJ digging through record bins. That was like my romanticized version of this. But uh, you know, I'd go to a used bookshop, I'd start in the upper left corner and I, every book I would just flip through going all the way down the walls to see if there were markings because used bookstores try not to buy books that are marked. So you gotta, you kinda gotta dig a little bit. And I ended up collecting about 2000 that had all the, the markings of the previous owners and basically created this library that I wanted to be interactive of all of these books that had the markings of the person who once owned them. And museum visitors were invited to open the books, flip through them, sit and read them, and kind of explore this exchange of information and wisdom and strangeness. Um, the image here on the left is one of, I just love this book because what it is is somebody had used a newspaper as a bookmark and the acid from the newspaper burned the page. And over time it's kind of slipped down. 
So you get this gradient acid burn on the book. And on the right, you'll see that there, I made these bookmarks. And you can see them if you look on the left end image uh, where museum goers could, if they found something that was interesting uh, that somebody else had marked, they could put a bookmark in for the next viewer, next visitor to kind of find and experience. So it became really in interactive and engaging. And um, a few of these notes, just examples of what's in these books. Um, I will sing solo gospel and music focused on healing and empowering, lifting up men, brotherhood, and gay male relationships. Um, the next one, let me minimize this real quick. I can't minimize it, but I'll just try my best. Uh, make a list of things you're self-conscious about. What to wear, how to talk, what to do, how to do my hair, when to laugh, when to cry, when to talk. It's a little bit blocked. I hope I got that right. Um, <clears throat> a few more examples of used books from this library. Uh, where are you, Lindy? <laughs> um, the middle one is like a high school German book that someone used to stash whatever they were stashing. I don't know, but it's like hollowed out. Um, the next one is like a, a book that I just love because it's Our Town, which of course we have a relationship to here in this region. Um, I mean, it's like an angsty uh, high schooler. That's my imagination of who this person was. Um, like, I'll never see you after this year. Like, I can't read the right-hand side right now but because of the Zoom, but you can read it. It's just like some angsty, angsty kid who's just hates this scene that they're stuck in. Um, and then things like this, you know, like this is also like a high school type thing, like crossing out words to make swears in books. This is a separate piece by John Knowles. Um, someone really organized with their highlighting. You know, that for me is really exciting. Um, this is, um, you know, the rabbi and the cantor are singing songs in the temple. And I just love the markation of like what key or what notes or you know, just that somebody else touched this, this book. It's not just a book. It's like, it's an artifact. And then drawings. This is a drawing from 1920. Them writing of them is just my sentiments. You know, so that was just like this treasure trove of other people's stuff. And I got inspired to make some work based off these books too. So this is a piece called Star Chart. It's, um, I don't know how many, but these are all stars scanned from the margins of the books in the library. So anytime somebody thought something was meaningful to mark, enough to mark, they would make a little mark. I do it all the time. And so this is like a star chart of these handwritten marks that people had made in their books. And then these pieces are uh, examples of books that I scanned and removed all the text where the person had highlighted every single word on the page, which I think is like people in higher ed or just in the world. I can relate to it, but you know, read something and highlight everything. But if you highlight everything, you highlight nothing, right? It's a uh, uh, destruction through, you know, overly, overly examining. So um, I like to think of these as like minimal, minimalist paintings, you know? Um, it's just Photoshop work of scanning the pages and removing the text. And then the final part of this piece was a, a vitrine of objects that people had left in the books as bookmarks you know, or had tucked away in a book and forgotten about. You know, some of the times these books are found in estate sales. Sometimes they're, they, they're resold at used bookstores. But um, this is just a few examples of the vitrine. And I just, you know, personal histories, you can't get enough. I love this image on the left. So um, somebody at a, with one of those aura cameras that were like, hip in the 70s and 80s that would photograph your aura. Um, this guy actually came to the exhibit and emailed me and was like, I can't believe you found that picture of me. That was some insurance convention in like 1982 or something. Um, this letter on the right, I love that line at the end of it. I find myself seeking your critical approval. Uh, picture from Korea, sonogram. Somebody's really crazy schedule um, has like baseball games and TV stuff. And it's just this really amazing note. Um, the, the note on the left is somebody contemplating suicide. And it's a really heavy note. Uh, who am I writing to? Um, 
who's reading what I've written? And pairing that with something on the right, you know, a postcard from Lake Winnipesaukee, where somebody wrote on the postcard, my room, where we stayed. And it's just kind of juxtaposition of like life and death and, and uh, heavy and light. And then an, an example like this um, it was so nice last week when you recognized that my discouragement had something to do with our talk. In some ways, things feel easier with the truth out. I agree with you that just because we don't have a love relationship now doesn't mean we can't have one in the future. It's just getting there and how. I wonder about these things. When you let me see you, you're beautiful. Why do you keep hiding? And so like just this kind of privileged glimpse into all of these lives of people I don't know. Um, a few more projects. Uh, right. This is... Um, a piece that was partially funded by a, a faculty grant here at Keene State. It's called Are You Here? Um, and it's another public artwork. I love language, right? And uh, I love this phrase, you are here, that you see on maps. And thinking about like the idea of what does it mean to be here? Am I really here? Am I present? Or does it mean I'm physically here? Which is what this means. So I found myself just really thinking a lot about the idea of being present and not being distracted by social media and the internet and the news and everything else in my life that distracts me. <laughs> so I tried, I decided to do a public, um, kind of like a public service campaign or something like that. I, I rented 14 billboards all around um, upstate New York, Massachusetts, this is 2016, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, upstate New York. Billboards are illegal in Vermont, so we couldn't do it here. And New Hampshire was sold out, which I think is amazing. Um, so the billboards just said, are you here? There was no marking of my name or what this was. It was just in the landscape. And I ended up for two reasons. A, it was cheaper, but B, I like the idea of it being really remote. You know, like not next to a store where you could confuse it as an advertising message, but in the landscape. And just the idea that if you're driving on a country road and you see this billboard for, for a brief second, you get snapped out of whatever, wherever you are and are there, you know, and this idea of kind of being present. So it's a series of 14 billboards throughout the region. And, um, and you know, they read like landscape photographs, but I think of them as documentation. I think of the billboards as the piece. And it was a strange experience because, you know, you, you never really know what people think of what you're doing, even if it's in a gallery or museum or something, but especially when it's out in the world, I was just like, I don't know what, does anyone even get this? Like, does it make any sense? Do people even notice it? And uh, I guess that's what being an artist is. It's just wondering those things. And one of the videos was, uh, or one of them is a video because uh, I was able to secure one digital billboard, which is where it rotates through multiple ads. Um, and I'm gonna show you just one cycle of this really quickly right now. This is in Chicopee, Mass. Red I-91. I love that I followed uh, the gun thing, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you know, this is there's a lot of media theory written about this, but like yeah, the experience of 
seeing it in a context of other things then decontextualizes it and kind of does an interesting thing with it. Um, this piece was also commissioned by the de Cordoba Sculpture Park down in Lincoln, Mass. So after the project was installed out in the world, uh, they commissioned a installation at their sculpture park. So we built a billboard, which was really fun. And this was installed there for a year and a half. It also was hung above the Amtrak station in Brattleboro for a month. So every, uh, you know, I just printed it out on vinyl. So every Amtrak train that would go past and stop at the station would look at that sign, you know, trying to mimic the highway. And then these are what it looked like in a, in a museum. This is the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, I made these free giveaway um, posters where you could unfold them and they made a big poster. I've got one up in my office right here. And you could hang it up in your space just to remind yourself to be present. I have a ton of them. If anyone on campus wants one, let me know, I'll give you one. Um, and then at my gallery in Boston, I created wallpaper. Uh, I printed it, actually printed it here. See, I like to tie it back to Keen. Um, but this is a wallpaper of one of the billboards. It's about 20 feet wide in strips and uh, nine feet tall. But I wanted to try to create the feeling of what it feels like to stand in front of one of these because they're no longer installed. Um, another piece that was at that gallery, and I've got, I'm getting to the end, I swear to God. Uh, all right, uh, it's called Let's Start by Stating the Obvious. Uh, this was, again, I mean, with the idea of serial imagery from the car to the clothing to the billboards, this fits in that same pattern. I was getting ready to give a lecture, kind of like this, one night, and I was thinking to myself, you know, in a moment of insecurity, what do I know? I don't know anything. Like, you know, how am, I, how am I supposed to go and present myself as being knowledgeable about things when I don't feel very knowledgeable right now? And then my mind started thinking about, what do you say when you don't know what to say? You say, let's start by stating the obvious. Like, let's start by stating the obvious. I'm talking to you right now. State the obvious. I'm in my office. It's a way of diverting from having to give anything that's of content and it's deflective. And so I just Googled this phrase. I was really curious, like what, what comes up if I Google, let's start by stating the obvious. So these are the top eight results that came up in my web browser based on my algorithms and all that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of that phrase, let's start by stating the obvious. So this is the first line, the part that's in bold when you do a Google search. Let's start by stating the obvious. Most recreational fishermen do not own a boat. So I was hooked at this one. I was like, what? That's not obvious to me. I don't know anything about this. So I'm, I'm like, really, it becomes about the audience. Yeah, it is obvious if you're a fisherman, I guess, but it's not obvious to me. So um, let's start by stating the obvious. All surfaces in a landscape have to be covered with something. That's my favorite. I love it. That is the dumbest statement ever. Of course, yeah, grass, concrete, I don't know, something, air. Um, let's start by stating the obvious. Every strategy works. So these are screen printed. This was the first time I experimented with um, silk screening and I did it here at Keene State again with the, the faculty uh, in the art department helped teach me how to do this um, for the purpose of this exhibit. Let's start by saying the obvious, things are not good nor do they look like they are getting better. Let's start by saying the obvious, being able to predict volcanic eruptions is good. Let's start by stating the obvious. This is a $30 hotel. Let's start by stating the obvious. The term trade or business is comprised of three words, trade or business. Let's start by stating the obvious. The internet is a vast realm. So I think of this like that billboard, that digital billboard on the side of I-91. It's like when you take these things out of context and then throw them together, it creates this weird other thing. Um, so this is what it looks like installed on a wall. It's uh, eight screen prints featuring each of these phrases, just thinking about the, the idea of the word obvious. And then the last completed project is a project called Free. And um, I think, you know, living in this region, a lot of us know about like finding free stuff on the side of the road. And I just got really obsessed with the idea of this word. I love that I would drive around or go for a walk and if I was paying attention in the landscape, I would just see this word, this reminder, free, free. 
and and I would decontextualize it away from like free stuff to like the word free. Just it's everywhere. It's all around me, like free. And so what I started doing was collecting these signs. Because <laughs> for me, what the beauty of them is like the material they're on, the handwriting and everything. So I would create a replacement sign. I didn't want to mess up their commerce exchange, you know, but then I would take the free sign. And this is at a gallery in North Adams. It's run by uh, Paul and Lynn here in the art department. They have a gallery space in North Adams and they let me do an installation. So it's about 300 free signs. And when you walked in the gallery, it was just floor to ceiling of this word. And what happened just from hearing people talk, you know, when you're an artist, you like, when you have an opening, you get really shy and you curl up in the corner. And, but then you eavesdrop and you hear what people are saying. And um, what I heard people saying was what I hoped they would be saying, which was that the more they saw the word free, the more abstract it started to look, where it looked like it was misspelled. And it felt, it felt just confusing uh, to see that word so many times repeated. And if it said anything specific, like free air conditioner, I wouldn't include it. It had to just say the word free or like free stuff. Does it mean like there's free stuff here? Or does it mean like free stuff? You know, I like it that way. Um, so yeah, wood, spray paint, cardboard. Uh, if the sign was super awesome, I would usually knock on the door and ask the person if it was, you know, try to explain like, I'm an artist, I want your free sign, like whatever. Um, and then this was also commissioned as billboards by the Courier Art Museum in Manchester and an organization called Four Freedoms, who I brought to campus to talk about um, their work through the art department. Um, this was two billboards. This one was downtown Manchester, and this was somewhere near the Courier. I'm not sure where. And that brings me to what I'm working on now. And then I'm going to close with that. And hopefully I'm not, I don't even have a clock, so I don't even know what time it is, but hopefully I'm doing all right. Um, sonic Blanket. So this is what I'm working on right now. And this is a real departure for me. It's really new terrain and it's exciting and scary. So, you know, a year ago, COVID happens, right? And we all become very isolated. And <laughs> especially in those early days, I'd go for a walk and I would, well, uh, let me step back a second. I had a radio show. Brattleboro has a community radio station and I'm a music fanatic. And uh, so for years I had a radio show, community radio show. And I loved the idea of radio because radio is, is a different than the internet. It's not like zeros and ones. It's, it's like more like a, I like to think of it as like a physical thing that like radio waves in the air. Um, so I'd always love that, but I start, I would go for walks during the early days of COVID and everyone was like, especially scared at that moment. And as I was walking, I would just see like a light on in this house, a light in, on in that house. And just like feeling that kind of fear and the separation. And I started thinking about the idea of um, a blanket, like a, a blanket that could like cover and nurture us as like a community uh, in Brattleboro. And I like the, the metaphor of radio waves being a blanket. You know, it's like they're, they go a finite width. I think it's about 10 miles. And everything underneath it is like blanketed by these sound waves. Uh, you could think of it like a force field that's protecting, or you could think of it like a blanket that covers and nurtures. But it's a thing that connects us in our disconnection. Um, and so I started thinking about this idea. This is a, a map of Brattleboro in 1886. And I'm a big sucker for historical societies. And so I started looking at as many aerial pictures of Brattleboro as I could and like imagining like the idea of this invisible blanket, this blanket we can't see, but it's there. Not, not in 1886, but now. Um, and so I contacted a radio station and said like, I'd like to create a piece that every night will broadcast at like one in the morning to blanket the town while it sleeps and create a kind of a blanket, you know, like in, in the truest sense that you curl up under. Problem being is that like, I'm not a writer and I'm not a musician, <laughs> but I like the idea. And so I ended up, um, this is a postcard from the top of Mount Wantasticate. 
or went to Astagoc. So the first thing I did was I, I got in my car and I drove to see where the signal stopped. Like, what's the shape of this blanket? You know, the radio, if you go for outside into that white zone, you lose the radio signal. So this is like the actual visualization of what the radio waves based on my car and my antenna and all that kind of stuff um, looks like. And then I started reaching, I started thinking about reaching out and collaborating, which is something that's kind of new to me to other artists who live underneath this blanket and like thought together we could create something that was like community built in a community in a community forum, the radio waves that blankets and protects. Um, so this is the antenna of the station, which I'm kind of obsessed about. And the, the key for me was to find the right people to collaborate with. So Diana Whitney is a poet uh, in Brattleboro and she falls under that blanket. And Weston Olenke is a, a musician and composer and experimental sound artist. And the more I dove into their work, the more I realized like these were the right people I wanted to work with. Um, so what we've been doing is every two weeks we've been having Zoom conversations. We're going for walks. I like this picture because he has a cat on his shoulder. If you can't see it. Um, and trying to figure out how to collaboratively create a sound composition, poetry, and we're reaching out to a few more collaborators um, in the hopes that they'll join us. Um, so it really is this community created thing. And in closing, I think what I'll just say is like, for me, not having control, not being the maker, but being more the facilitator has been a really interesting thing. And in our conversations, they get abstract in this really beautiful way. So we have Google folders and stuff. And I, I will drop in things like things that look the way I think it should feel, <laughs> you know, like that's so abstract. So I'm just going to share with you a few images that are not mine, but they're images I've shared with my collaborators as a way of kind of trying to tap into the language and the feel and the music of how I envision this piece existing. So this is um, an artist, Carson Ellis, who we brought to Keene State last year. Um, Cable Griffith, an artist in Seattle, UFO. Um, and, you know, it really is just me like researching images, like, and just being like, yeah, that has that feeling of late at night while the town sleeps and from above, or like the quiet of um, the forest at night or the Northern lights. And just doing a lot of research too on art of the invisible, you know, how do you make art about something that's invisible? So, I have some ideas. There, there will be some visual components to this, but um, but this is kind of where I'm at right now and just figuring this out with these two collaborators, how to make something together. Um, and with that in a parched throat, I will exit because that is my slideshow. So thank you. Happy to answer questions. And no, I didn't do that bad on time. I went over by oh, four minutes. You did, you did great, John. And, and when you said, I don't know what time it is, so let me see if I can get my camera. Okay. Um, you were actually right on time. <laughs> I thought you did that very much on purpose. And uh, I also want to say uh, thank you very much. This is something I'm noticing with the Zoom webinar that, that, and that instead of being in a room uh, and projecting these and having an audience is that the, the moment of uh, applause and, and initial appreciation is is much more muted and, and actually absent. And I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, it's fine. I, I hope it, uh, yeah, it's, so it's a very strange experience. I'll be honest, uh, like <laughs> yes. doing, but whatever. Well, so um, I have a bunch of questions, but uh, there are a number of questions in the chat um, and there are attendees with their hands up. Uh, I think I will start just kind of reading off some of the things I see in the chat uh, and, and seeing if we can round it out that way. Um, there's a big long one um, from Lisa, but uh, this is a, a short one. Uh, and the mm -hmm. question is this, it's a nice presentation, uh, right? Do you ever use national or world events to inspire your art? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so for example, I mean, I, I'm really like the mostly interested in 
the micro, right? But but yeah, that's everything is inter interconnected, right? So like one of the things that inspired Are You Here was there, it was during the period right after the tsunami in Japan. And it was this moment where with journalism and with, with um, newspapers, there was this big push to get rid of photography departments. Um, and so CNN, which I feel like is my nemesis, uh, but I look at it every day, but it's my nemesis. Um, they would always have these really annoying things like, are you in Japan? Send your pictures. Are you here? Are you there? Are you here? Are you there? So it was like looking at the, the way in which there was suddenly this call for like um, amateur generated images to represent the news was really kind of some of the phrasing that put that into effect. Um, the word free was certainly connected with the experience of living for the past four years uh, in the United States of America. And it's a very complex time to be here. Um, you know, I just, I think these things are all connected. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but, sure. but yeah, I don't know. But that's an answer. I want to reiterate, by the way, that the free, um, the impression that people get from the free display that it deconstructs the word and it looks like it's actually misspelled and, and pretty soon you'd lose track of it. That happened immediately to me as soon as I saw the pictures of the, mm. the gallery in Brattleboro. Um, and, uh, or I mean, down in Massachusetts. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, there was one that I lost. What's uh, here? A lot of people are interested in, in sort of the moment of uh, inspiration or creation. Uh, what's the moment like when glimmerings of an idea become a decision to do a project? You know, sometimes it'll be like quick, you know, like if it's, especially if it's a smaller project, like um, let's start by stating the obvious. It was, it was a pretty quick, like I had the thought, I Googled it and I was like, I want to make something. But most times it's like, I keep a, I keep an active sketchbook and I write down like tons and tons of ideas I never make or never, never go anywhere. But I usually find that what happens with me is an idea will like plant its seed based on, it can be something I saw or thought, or it just comes from somewhere. But then I'll sit on it like for a while. And it's, I, I kind of feel like, and I've heard other artists and, and musicians and, and creative people say this, it's like if it stays with me, if like a week later, if two weeks later, I'm still thinking about it, then I'm like, I think I have to make something about this. I think I have to figure it out. And for me, a lot of my projects are a matter of figuring stuff out, like the the actual going and well, that's not always true, but um, yeah, it was like like the free sign one. It was like two years of walking around, seeing these things, and thinking about like, do I photograph them? Do I just make like a bunch of photographs, or no, that doesn't feel right. Do I try to copy them, like hand copy them? No, that doesn't feel right. And just like it, the idea is still sitting there percolating. And then the moment of clarity can come anytime. Like it can come, uh, you know, in a shower or it can come uh, walking down the street or whatever. But, um, but usually these things there, there's just like a lit, I have like a lot, I'm a list maker too. So I'll have like in my studio, like lists of like possible ideas. Um, but I have projects I haven't made yet that I've been thinking about for eight years that I know are going to be made. I just haven't figured out what they're gonna look like yet. Um, and I have other ideas that I thought were totally brilliant. And then the next morning was like, that's terrible. So um, it depends, but it's, there's a percolation period. Sure. Um, I, I'm gonna stick in a question there because some of this, some of the ideas seem to cost money, like buying books and, and putting up billboards and stuff like that. And some of the ideas just seem to be, you know, doing a thing that, that, that you know, executing a thing that, that was just in the back of your mind. Yeah. Um, when you get an idea that has to cost money, do you have to go looking for that money first? I, I guess so. Um, I commit, I mean, I, you know, maybe foolishly, I commit, like, I'm like, I'm doing this. But then I'm like, okay, but how am I going to pay for that? Right. And then it's like a hustle. So it's a lot of grant writing. Um, there's been a lot of institutional support here at Keene State. Um, also Vermont state funding, um, I've done Kickstarters, I've done uh, you know, print sales to try to raise money. It's just like, I have to make this project. I don't have the money, but I know if I'm creative with how to, to do it. And 
when I say grant writing, I mean, I get rejected like 99% of the time, right? It's not like I'm like a genius grant writer, but I write a lot of grants um, and I get a lot of rejections, but I get a few yeses. Um, and then also just like, you know, like with the billboards, reaching out to the company and being like, I want the cheapest billboards you've got. And they're like, well, they're really remote. It's like, perfect. And then, you know, being like, well, can you throw in a few for free since I'm buying so many of them? And just trying to like, you know, people tend to, with the books, the used books, I would tell, you know, used book owners, used bookshop owners love used books. And you start talking to them about your project and every single one of them would be like, oh, you want to see my, I've been stashing stuff too. I love collecting this kind of stuff. And then they would start just throwing in like, I'd come up with a big box and I'd be like, I don't know, 10 bucks. Cause I was going every single day buying books from them. Um, you know, you form these relationships and at the show at Matt Smoke, I actually named and thanked all of the bookstores that had helped me in the, the um, you know, acquiring of them. But, but I also, you know, I do spend my own money. Like it's, it's not all free, but I, I try to spend as little of my money as I can. Sure, understood. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Marie Duggan, she has her, her hand up. Uh, I'm, I've am i just allowed you to talk, Marie, if you want to take your microphone off, you want to unmute. There you are. I, actually, um, I have to confess that I had no intention of raising my hand, oh. but I did <laughs> want to just say how wonderful it was, especially, I guess I used to live in New York City and the way with the garbage cans, you know, the way you have the repetition, there's garbage cans that you see every day in exactly the same place with similar people walking by. But of course, then you're started to disappear. That was a good story. It just made me remember that life well, in the subway too, like where you try to find the right place to get in. It just made me remember the way that in a city, you constantly see the same things in a way we don't really hear. But I thought you really captured that aspect of city life in kind of a, a backward you know, an indirect fashion. Oh, thanks. That's really nice. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a similar comment um, in the in the chat, uh, a long one from Lisa Di Giovanni. Um, she, you know, wants to say, you know, what a wonderful world. Look into the world of an artist. I, I'm going to read it. For me, the following comment sums it up. And I, I noticed this comment when you said it too. That's the wonder of the world when you stop to look at it. Well, we, your colleagues and students, are lucky to interact with you and your creativity. And the other comment that stands out, and I, I got this one I noted too, uh, this is the treasure trove of other people's stuff. Uh, we see that not only in your, your curiosity, but appreciation of others. Um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is what comes out in your talk, is the wonder of the world uh, when you stop to look at it. Is that a common approach to the art of photography? Would you say that's a theme of all photographers is the wonder of the world if they I mean that's what a photography does it, yeah. it spot, shines a spotlight on something because you know a photograph by its very nature it, it's cut off from the rest of the world right it has a frame that the world expands beyond it but a person who takes a picture is basically like taking a giant spotlight and shining it on something and saying that is something important I think should be looked at um, but there's, a, there's, there's as many kinds of photographers as there are anything. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't make that as a general generalization, but, um, but I do, that's one of the things I love about photography is it really is, it's, it's dissecting the world. It's just, it's taking a little piece and cutting it out of context and, and saying, this is, this is important. I've got a, a hand up, Jason Pelletier. Uh, yeah, there you are. Yeah, John, that was fantastic. Um, I was I was struck by you jokingly said when you were talking about your sweet spot project, you jokingly referred to yourself as a pseudoscientist. Um, but I think you might be selling yourself short. You you know <laughs> I don't know of many artists who actually consulted with a statistician um, for you know for part of their project. Uh, and I was I was just kind of struck that not obviously with that one, but um, with several of these projects, there's like a, I, I saw a lot of the theme of 
um, you know, geography and maps and um, numbers and data and even like experimentation, like your trash can thing was you were doing, you know, you were collecting data to figure out, you know, what's happening to your trash can. So I think there's like, a, I saw a lot of kind of science math um, sort of connections throughout the work. And I'm just curious, what's your background in that? And do you, is that something deliberate or where do you think that kind of connection comes from? Oh, that's a great question. And we'll have to do a collaboration between uh, your department and mine, it'd be awesome. Um, I mean, I was always a terrible math and science student, to be honest. Like I was, uh, I always struggled a lot with it in high school and, and beforehand, but I've grown to just really love it. Um, I, I, I love it as a way of trying to understand the world. And it's also, you know, abstract and flawed in, its, in itself. Like I, I think I talk to students a lot about like the process of trying to figure out how to make something is a lot like the scientific process of it's trial and error, it's experimentation, it's having a hypothesis and allowing for your hypothesis to be contradicted. Um, I think sometimes when I incorporate it, I mean, I love maps, like I'm a collector of maps. I can, um, and especially living in this part of the world more and more, it becomes a part of my, my, my thinking, but, um, I also like the inclusion of, of maps, of charts and numbers as a way of kind of, kind of like a little bit tongue in cheek, but like saying like, well, this must be true because there's information behind it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a way of like playing with the idea of, uh, of truth <laughs> in a way. Um, but no, but I think the main thing is I, I just, I love, the more I've kind of come to like read things about physics and although I'm still terrible at math, I'm really intrigued by math. The idea of, of having a question or a query and trying to understand it through failure. Failure is something I think is really amazing in art and science uh, as well as like, and failures can take you to really interesting places and lead to interesting things. So I have total love for it. I've, I've never felt like very competent in it, but I, but it's something I, I think you're right. Like, yes, it is definitely a part of my practice. There's no way around that. Like for sure. Um, but I don't have anything more articulate than that to say about it. I don't know. So there's a question in the, uh, in the chat uh, about uh, I guess the the label for the kind of work that you do. Uh, it's uh, from Mark Kepler. John, calling yourself a contemporary artist seems woefully inadequate. Is there some description you've you've given of your work and why? Is it ethnographic art, for example? I just call myself an artist. I mean, I don't know. It's I've been called like there's lots of different schools, and like I think one that I really love and connect with is conceptual art. Um, actually, Jason, going back to your, your uh, inquiry to your ties to this is like the idea of minimalist art from like the 1970s also is very science and statistically driven. Um, so, but it, you know, I just call myself an artist, just, I think in part because it's kind of like, I, I do the same thing with music, you know, I, I'm just like, you know, um, someone will ask me, uh, what genre is this artist? this musician and sometimes it's just like, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, I think, I think, uh, I don't know, I'll just say artist. That's just how I label myself. Okay. I keep it simple. So I have a question and mm -hmm. I'm gonna call for any last questions from other people too. Um, but uh, it's one that you sort of, you gave a little hint about in your talk, and that is what it's like to watch others encounter your installation or your work. And I, I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about that. I mean, you said at first you're shy, then you eavesdrop. But I mean, do they ever do they ever do things that surprise you, like always looking at that picture in the corner of the subway installation? Or do they ever like get fascinated by something that you just thought was just a a, a last minute add on or do they ever get things wrong you know do they ever at least not wrong but but radically different uh in terms yeah. of their interest or interpretation what's it really like a question 
Um, let me think about this for a second. I definitely get very shy. I definitely like painfully eavesdrop. Um, sometimes people will say things that are more, we'll see things that are connections that I'm not, I wasn't aware of that. I'm trying to think of a specific example, but um, you know, I'll have a conversation with somebody at an opening or something and they'll be like, I like how this connects to this and I'm really seeing this arc, you know, where they have a certain distance that I don't have. Um, I think people tend to talk about the humor in my work and sometimes they're like things that like, you know, some of the projects I don't really like said, I don't really think of it as being like humorous, but somebody will see, will like have an emotional reaction to it. Like where it's like, like that's funny or, or whatever. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Well, I think one of the like things that really like for me was the most moving was like with uh, with the Are You Here project, like like I said, I had no idea what people were thinking. Um, there, I guess in Greenfield, Mass, where there was one of them, enough people were like calling the newspaper to ask what they what they were that they figured it out and they contacted me and ran a little article about it. And a woman wrote me like a long letter about her experience encountering it and like what it meant to her. And it was, it was really personal and, um, and kind of validated the project for me uh, in a way. I think it's really about like connecting. Cause like, you know, as, as somebody who makes stuff and I think as just a human being, um, I feel insecure, you know? And I always wonder like, does this work? Does anyone gonna get this? Like, does this make sense? And so I think for me, like when I'm uh, engaging with an audience, it's really like, it's just, it's important, an important part of my practice because it's like a validation. You know, sure. some people don't like what I do, that's fine. But, but even that is like, fine. Like it's, uh, it's important, that, that exchange is important and it, it helps me kind of feel like I'm either on track or whatever. Sure. Seeking validation. <laughs> no, it's a great answer, uh, and it must be a really interesting piece of of your professional life to have that have the the the, the experience of watching people take it in. Um, there's one last question. It's actually a big one uh, at the end of the chat. Uh, paradoxically, your projects seem to reflect with veracity on inner experience of being human. How do you see this? How do you react to that? Well, for better or for worse, I like, I chalk it up to like my family <laughs> and where I come from. Um, like I said, like my parents are both social workers. They've bo both been very like engaged and in inquisitive about people and things and creative in the way they see things. Like uh, if you go for a walk with my dad, you'll hear like a million really strange observations about the world around him. And I think, I think it just like bred an interest in, in tuning into, you know, it's about society. It's about like tuning into like people. And um, I think growing up in the house that I grew up in just made me really interested in that. Um, I think also in part, like, Part of my practice comes from the fact that when I was in college, Marlboro College was a magical place that no longer exists, but it was one of those schools where you create your own major and there, was no, there wasn't like really a curriculum. And uh, I like to joke, but it's kind of true that I majored in existentialism. So I was just like reading uh, Albert Camus and like existentialism is like my, it's still a very important part of um, my worldview. And, and that, that philosophy and that way of thinking was all about the idea of temporality and like that we're, we're here for a moment and it's the experience and the things that are around us um, that are the meaning, you know, the meaning is the being um, because in that way of thinking philosophically, um, 
there's no insurance of of an after like you know, I'm not gonna get all religious and everything philosophical about it, but but that tends to be like the if I were to generalize like the the literature and philosophy that I was really in, influenced by really emphasized the need to be experiencing the world as it happens because that's all you got. Sure. And uh, and I think that that really has has played a role in terms of my worldview. Um, and also, you know, not surprisingly, my art practice as well. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, it's definitely, you know, a current of the are you here? Uh, yeah. Display. Um, so less, uh, uh, that is I, I I'm seeing a lot of uh, thank yous and wonderful talks, and it's been a pleasure and stuff like that. Now, just I'll just I'll say, just say real quick: if anyone is feel feels like so crazy that they want to see more, there's a lot more stuff on my. This was a highly edited list of stuff. You can always look me up in chat or uh, go on my website or whatever you want. So, I really Great. appreciate you all being here. Great. So take him up. He means it. <laughs> And uh, and with that, I will I'll wrap us up for the evening. Uh, Greg, thank you for your introduction. John, thank you for a wonderful talk. And audience, thanks for being here. 